Welcome back to another episode of the Educational AD Podcast. We'll be right back with today's guest, but we want to give a shout out to our podcast partners, We Coach, the Florida Coaches Coalition, the Global Community of Women in High School Sports, and Vital Signs Wall of Fame. Check out these four organizations, add them to your network, find out how they can help you in your program. And now, don't hit that fast forward button. Stay with us for the next three minutes. Let's uh, listen to our sponsors. Uh, there are eight great sponsors. You should have these people uh, affiliated with your athletic department. So here we go. We want to say thanks to Snap Mobile for their support. Go to snapraise.com. It's an entire suite of platforms designed to help you as an athletic director do your job better. You've got Snap Connect, Snap Store, Snap Manage, and of course, there's Snap Raise, their fundraising platform. We've used it with great success, and so can you. They even have a program where you can get your funding before you actually start your fundraiser. I don't think anybody else offers that. Go to snapraise.com for more information. We also want to say thanks to Hometown Ticketing, the leading digital ticketing provider to schools and colleges. Hometown has recently acquired Ticket Spicket, and together they can show you how to set up and sell your tickets online for all your events, not just athletics, but things like school dances, school plays, graduation. And every step of the way, Hometown's going to supply you with a dedicated client success manager that provides hands-on support every step of the way. That's every step of the way. Go to hometownticketing.com for more information. Simple and easy online ticketing. We want to say thanks to Sideline Interactive, indoor score tables and video boards. Go to sidelineinteractive.com, schedule a live web demo, and see their products in action. It's probably one of the best purchases I ever made as an athletic director. Go to sidelineinteractive.com, schedule that live web demo today. Sidelineinteractive.com. We also want to say thanks to Huddle. Go to huddle.com and change the way you see the game. Huddle is going to provide your school, your coaches, your teams, and your athletes the tools that you need to succeed at the highest level. It's going to be a professional-grade solution to the challenges that we all face as athletic directors. Go to huddle.com and see why we believe in sports and teams believe in Huddle. Join the 6 million users and turn your school into a Huddle school. We want to thank Gipper. Go to Gipper.com and see how athletic directors are creating world-class content for their school social media channel. Tell them you heard about it on the podcast. Use our code ADPOD10 and you'll get 10% off. That's Gipper.com. Create custom content for your school's social media channel. We also want to thank Wall of Fame by Vital Science. You know, they're on a mission to bring your school's legacy to life. Go to Vital Signs Wall of Fame. The Wall of Fame is an interactive touchscreen video console that's going to highlight your school's top performers in athletics, academics, and the arts, but it's so much more than that. The Wall of Fame is also an extensive content program that will help you tell more compelling stories to better engage your audience. Go to vitalsignswalloffame.com slash Jake. Check out their programs today. We also want to say thanks to Final Forms. Go to finalforms.com slash Jake and prepare for your best season ever. Final Forms will help you ensure compliance, reduce risk, increase safety. They'll help you meet state, district, and departmental requirements. Final Forms will help you communicate with coaches, with parents, with student athletes. Uh, it's also going to help you with all the reports that come across your desk. You know, it's time that you talk to a team that gets it. Go to finalforms.com slash Jake and join the Final Forms team. And we want to say thanks to Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack. Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack are a quick, easy, and affordable way for you to collect comprehensive data that allows you to evaluate and improve your entire program. Athletic directors typically only hear back from the 2%, that squeaky wheel parent or a frustrated athlete, and we should hear back from them so we can affect positive change. But Final Forms will connect you with that 98% that really love and support your program. And that's a tremendously valuable tool to have when you're talking to your principal, your school board, or that squeaky wheel parent. Go to athleticsurveys.com. See what they can do for you today. That's athleticsurveys.com.
Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Educational AD Podcast. We are staying right here in the state of Florida, going up to the Panhandle, and we're going to be visiting with Holly McDaniel. Holly is the athletic director at Fort Walton Beach High School, and that's in Fort Walton Beach. Um, been on the job, uh, I, I think, a little over a year now at Fort Walton Beach. Uh, did I get that right? Okay. Actually, this is my third year. I'm finishing. Third year. Off. Okay. Yeah, boy. Obviously, I'm. I, I need to catch up, but uh, very experienced in athletic administration. So, uh, Holly, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, you know, you and I were talking before we, you know, we we set this up a while back. Finally, able to do it. For our listeners, we're recording this on April. Fifth, so it's going to be pretty timely uh, when you're listening to it. Uh, spring is the busy time for AD, so we're going to jump right in. Um, Holly, we always like to let our listeners have a chance to get to know our guests. So give us that quick bio, where you were born, where you grew up. Uh, take us through those high school and college years. Then we'll take a quick break and uh, come back and hear about your early uh, teaching and coaching career. But what's the Holly McDaniel origin story? <laughs> Well, I was born in California. Um, my dad was in the military, so he was in the Air Force, and so I was a military brat. And uh, so, so I was born in California. About at the age of six, we moved to Okinawa, Japan. We spent three years in Okinawa. I'm the baby of the family, so I have two older sisters. And so uh, we didn't move as much by the time that, you know, I was born and, and my dad was in the middle of his career. We went to Okinawa, Japan, spent three years there. It was an amazing experience. Uh, just really kind of being involved in that culture and being around such a diverse group and, and uh, really loved the island. And then from Okinawa, Japan, we were fortunate to move to Fort Walton Beach, Florida. And this is where my dad retired. So from the fifth grade on through my high school career, um, we were here in Fort Walton Beach and we kind of settled in some roots. And this is really what I consider my hometown in Fort Walton. So I, I went through the school system here where I'm currently at. I was in middle school at Bruner Middle School, which is right down the street from Fort Walton Beach High School, which that's where I'm the AD at now. And I played basketball at Fort Walton Beach High School in the early 90s, which uh, calculates my age to be uh, late 40s. And so from 90 to 94, um, played basketball at Fort Walton Beach High School for one of the most remarkable coaches. He's actually in the FHSA Hall of Fame. His name is Kevin Craig. Um, had great a great four year career here, not individually, just as a team, um, and was a, fortunate enough to be around amazing athletes um, during that time period at Fort Walton Beach High School. Danny Warfel was here as a quarterback, and you know he won the Heisman at Florida, and um, a lot of other really great athletes were around me walking the hallways. We won a state championship in football. We won first time girls basketball, went to the final four. Um, I was the point guard, was my sophomore year. My senior year, we were fortunate enough to win the state championship. Um, I think that for the four year stint, we went 114 and 14 in four years. And um, I was around some amazing athletes. And so then when I graduated Fort Walton from Fort Walton Beach High School, I was fortunate enough to sign a scholarship to play Juco ball. I went to Tallahassee Community College. Um, I played a year there. It was actually their first year having a women's basketball program, which was really cool to be a part of that. Junior college really wasn't my thing. I think I uh, there was a lot more talent than uh, I had to offer in junior college. A lot of kids that really could play at the division one level. So after a year, I transferred and went to Columbus College it was, now it's Columbus State University. Uh, finished my playing career there, got a major in physical education and health. I knew I always wanted to be a high school basketball coach and was really wanting to come back home and maybe have an impact like my head coach did um, on me. So I, once I graduated and finished my student teaching, I had my car packed, my little Honda Prelude, and I drove back to the beach, which I missed, and I came back home. And I uh, came back home and I never left again. So I've been back home since 1998. Um, 
I became a math teacher here at Fort Walton Beach High School. Back then, they weren't dying for teachers. You, uh, my major was phys and in health, but you had to be willing to do anything possible to get a teaching job. So uh, I went back to college, got a couple of classes that required me to get to teach math, taught math, and I was assistant basketball coach for five years. And then um, the legendary coach, Coach Kevin Craig, um, he decided that he thought he wanted to retire from coaching girls basketball, got out, and I was fortunate enough to get the job in 2003. And that's when I became the head girls basketball coach here. And I continued to coach for another 17 years. So I was the head girls basketball coach here at Fort Walton um, until I moved into this position. And um, probably about maybe my 10th year of coaching girls basketball, I had the thought that I wanted to become an athletic director down the road. Um, at that time in Okaloosa County, the football coach was the AD. And, um, you know, it was like that from, from beginning until um, about three years ago. So in about 2006, 15, I decided I was gonna go back and get my ed leadership degree. Um, I really wanted to change the fact that the AD had to be the football coach. And I think education and, and resume has to fit and align with some accomplishments. So I went back, I got my ed leadership degree and um, after I graduated from that, I set up a meeting with superintendent and said, you know, I've spent 25 years of my life coaching and the only way to move up in this, in this industry is for me to get out of the athletic world if I wanted to, because I'm a female. Um, and it changed, it changed. And uh, I was fortunate enough to, to be the first female athletic director in Okaloosa County three years ago. Wow. Um, we've had a number of people that, you know, ha have come on and they talk about, you know, going back to the school uh, as a teacher, a coach, or as an AD, uh, where they went to high school. Now, you know, you did that, but before becoming an AD, you know, I mean, you were there for uh, a, a number of years. Um, how was that when you first came back? Uh, I, I'm going to imagine some of your teachers and coaches were still still there in the building. Um and we've heard all sorts of different stories. It was very welcoming or, you know, hey, they kind of gave me a hard time because I was, you know, the they knew me as a student. Um, how was that for you? What was your experience coming back to where you had been so successful as a student athlete? It was amazing. Um, it, it really was. The, the teachers here were so welcoming. I mean, so many of them, you know, mentored me growing up just as a as a student, right, and and really changed my life, you know, and and I was really fortunate. I I grew up in a family there. I had you know two parents in the household. My mom was a stay at home mom, that really um, supported me and and really gave me a growth mindset. Where you know my dad has three daughters, and it doesn't matter if you're a woman. It doesn't matter if I'm five two and I played basketball. And my dad said it doesn't matter if you're five two. Um, you can do and become anything you want to be. And and when I got to Fort Walton Beach High School as a kid, as a you know as a young young lady, fourteen years old, you know um, I had teachers that did the same and coaches that did the same that just really built their students up and, and believed in them and really mentored them. And when I came back, um, I think I looked like I was still 14 years old when I was 22. And so I, I tried to dress like I was older than I was to try to separate myself from the kids. But um, it, it for, for me, this is home. And so, you know, and, and I think it's the people in the building that make it feel like home. And I was really fortunate that there's just amazing people in this building and, and they really welcomed me back. And, and, and the coach, you know, my coach Craig who coached me just had such a huge impact on my life and my career. You know, he took me in and he uh, met me where I was at, you know, at 22 years old. Cause that's, that's an age that's really, it's a really interesting age when, especially if you play, you know, college sport, you're trying to your whole life, you have, 
you have built around a sport. And I think all your time is taken up by dedicating, you know, that to your craft. And, and then when you lose that, you got to find a new passion. Um, you know, he met me where I was at really grew me as a coach, um, and, and as an assistant coach to prepare me, he knew, he knew I wanted to be a head coach one day. And I was just really lucky to be under one of the best and him to just put his arms around me and, um, teach me, um, how he did things. Cause he did things, um, so well, so well. Yeah. Very cool. I mean, th these types of stories I could talk all day, but uh, obviously we, we don't have a, all that time, but appreciate you sharing all that. And it's just so cool to hear for our listeners. Our guest today is Holly McDaniel. She's the director of athletics at Fort Walton beach high school. Uh, you know, I think a Viking through and through uh, we're going to take our first break, but we're going to be back with some more. So please stay with us. This is the educational AD podcast. We want to thank Snap Mobile for their support of the podcast. Go to snapraise.com and you're going to find an entire suite of platforms designed to help you as an athletic director do your job better. You've got Snap Manage, Snap Store, Snap Connect, and of course there's Snap Raise, their fundraising platform. We use it at our school with great success and they've helped schools just like yours raise over $700 million. They even have a program where you can get your funding before you actually start your fundraiser. I don't think anybody else offers that. Go to snapraise.com for more information. We also want to say thanks to Hometown Ticketing, the leading digital ticketing provider to schools and colleges. Go to hometownticketing.com. They're going to show you how to sell your tickets online, not just for athletic events, but for things like school plays, concerts, school dances, even graduation. And the best part, Every step of the way, you'll have a dedicated client success manager that's providing you hands-on support. That's every step of the way. Go to hometownticketing.com and find out more. Simple and easy online ticketing. Welcome back, everyone, to the Educational Lady Podcast. Once again, our guest is Holly McDaniel. She is the Director of Athletics at uh, Fort Walton Beach High School here in Florida. Holly, um, you were sharing a little bit about the the mentoring that uh, you experienced coming back to Fort Walton Beach, where you'd gone to high school. One of the things we like to do is acknowledge those mentors that we've had, because none of us get to where we're at on our own. So who are some of the people that uh, helped you, whether it was a, a pat on the back or a kick in the butt? Uh, who are some of your mentors uh, in your journey so far? Uh, well, first, my parents, you know, and, and I think sometimes we forget that our parents are our are, are mentors. And, um, you know, my dad, who, you know, is so selfless and served in the military and uh, was a servant leader, you know, I think that watching him become be a servant leader really uh, helped develop who I was. Um, you know, my mom was a stay at home mom and sometimes worked some odd jobs, but um, the support that she gave to my dad and really was the rock in the family when my dad was deployed had a huge impact on me. Um, you know, and, and my two older sisters, right, like they were they were my best friends and, and really somebody I can lean on when you have older siblings. Sometimes you learn from their struggles and or learn from their mistakes and and you really have those in that in family mentors, um, you know, but in in this building in Fort Walton at Fort Walton Beach High School, um, the mentors that really crafted who I became as a as an educator um, was Miss Charlene Kubion, who was my English teacher uh, when I we went to high school here. And then when I came back, she ended up coming back from the district because she went to the district um, for a short period of time. And she became the assistant principal here and later became the principal. And so it's really interesting how our relationship developed over time. You know, she went from a teacher of mine in the classroom, um, an amazing English teacher who uh, loved her subject, had a lot of passion for her subject, but more, impa more importantly, she just loved kids and had a passion of growing kids, right, and supporting them. Um, and, and so we went from, you know, her as a teacher to her as an assistant principal for me. 
and really developed me as an educator. You know, she'd come in the classroom. She would, um, you know, help me in the classroom with whether it was classroom management or teaching strategies and or show me how to constantly grow as an educator and network to learn from other people. And then of course, as a principal. And then through that time, I can say she's one of my closest friends. So, uh, I mean, last week we went and had dinner together. She went to my son's baseball game and, and uh, you know, she's still mentoring me. She's retired, but she, she's still mentoring me. And she just had a huge impact of me as an educator and what that means. Um, not only in the classroom, but out in the community and um, as a colleague. Yep. Uh, again, I, I just love to hear the stories of, you know, the individuals that um, have had those impacts. And it's great to hear when they are still uh, a part of your life. It's not just, a, you know, a name or, or, or a person from the past. Uh, once again, appreciate you sharing that. Um, yeah. Holly, and another thing we try to do with this podcast is the idea of sharing best practices. And so I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, what are some things that y'all do at Fort Walton Beach that you're particularly proud of that when, when you take a step back, you can say with, with equal parts, pride and humility, boy, we really do a great job with this. Uh, do you have any best practices you can share? Well, sure. But really my best practices are stolen from others, right? I, Absolutely. I, yeah. <laughs> so, you, you know, my, my high school coach and who I coached under really helped me develop some really good practices that I'm proud of here because I learned it through him through the game of basketball, not only as a player, but as an assistant coach. And even to this day, you know, we talk about still mentoring. He still mentors me um, to this day in this leadership role, even though he was never an AD. I think that when you are a coach in a program, um, it's the same thing as if you're running an athletic department. It's just on a bigger scale when you're in the, you know, when you're at the athletic director. Um, and I, what I, some of the best practices I think that we have is that, you go into a building and sometimes you see a lot of mission statements or visions and you forget about what it takes to, to make that happen every single day. And what do you do every single day that's going to reach the goals that you want to reach, right? And so um, this is something that I learned from him, not only as a player, but as assistant coach. When I was a player here at Fort Walton and when I was a coach, our I guess it's probably for 40 years, our motto was whatever it takes. And it's something we live by every single day. And it wasn't just a motto or, you know, a mission statement. It was more broke. It was broken down. It was, are you doing whatever it takes in the classroom? Are you doing whatever it takes in the community? Are you doing whatever it takes um, as a daughter? or as a son. And so, you know, breaking it down where you understand that every single thing you do 24 hours a day is what ends up getting to your goals. And so I, I took that, you know, that I learned from him and that was our motto when I was a coach, right? It worked, why would you change it in the same program? But then I put it on a bigger scale in our athletic department and we chose the word grit. And it, and it stands for growth, respect, integrity, and trust. Are you still there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hang on for okay. one second. So we took the whatever it takes motto and kind of created something in our athletic department on a, on a larger scale. And so we use what we call grit. It stands for growth, respect, integrity, and trust. And our coaches live by that. And our student athletes, we are trying to get them to live by that. And I think that one of the things I learned, you know, under Coach Craig is that your staff has to model what you want your student athletes to do. And they have to demonstrate that every single day so that they see that um, being done and that we have to model it for them. So for, for us as an athletic department, 
you know, we, we talk a lot about continuously growing. So that's where the, the growth is, right, within our profession, um, within, you know, whether it's that sport and, and just individually and even as teachers, because we are educators. And so if you're, you know, if you're teaching math and you're, you're a coach, you should be growing in that area too. Um, respect all the time. We should be showing respect regardless of, you know, if somebody comes at us negatively and in, in today's time, it's tough, right? You got parents that um, are really intense. And I think we deal with a lot more um, parent issues than ever before. And so, you know, we have to demonstrate respect all the time, regardless, respect um, to our student athletes, respect to our cat, uh, colleagues, respect um, to the sport, to the game that we coach, um, integrity, um, you know, have an integrity in everything that you do and, and that we trust each other, that we trust our, our colleagues, we trust our um, leaders in our building, we trust our principal, um, we trust the system. And so uh, as an athletic department, I take great pride in, in really what our coaches do. It's, it's not what I do, it's what they do and that what they demonstrate to their student athletes. And then we ask that of our student athletes. And, and, you know, it's okay to make mistakes. If you're growing, you're gonna make mistakes. And it's okay to, um, you know, for us to have to correct you, but then, you know, you gotta come back, come back around and you gotta get better. And so I think as a, as a staff, what we do well is that we are great models for our student athletes. And that's something that we take a lot of pride in. And I think that it shows our student athletes doing the same. Yeah. I, I, you probably saw me uh, scribbling down, you know, your grit, uh, growth, respect, integrity, and trust. Um, and as you were sharing, it reminded me so much of a phrase that uh, I used for most of my AD career. I didn't invent it. Uh, you know, like you said, you know, we steal all the good ideas from somebody else, mm -hmm. but uh, our coaches and I think our parents and our, our kids uh, followed this. Uh, it was everything we see at, at your school, everything we see at my school, everything we see, it's either coached or it's allowed. Which one is it for you? And just listening to you, I can tell that, you know, you're coaching your coaches and those kids are coaching those kids on how they should you know, be representing the school. You know, again, the whole respect thing. I, I just love it. Great stuff. Um, well, I appreciate it. You know, just to add in, you know, not only did I learn that from Coach Craig, but there is a series of books that's called um, What Drives Winning. I don't know if, yep. if you know, it's very popular and they have a lot of um, YouTube videos that you can watch some of the greatest coaches in the country talking about their best practices and everything. And, and um, before I got this position, I really dove into that as a coach, what drives winning, which um, really kind of ties in a piece of that was um, the Oklahoma coach tied in a little bit about how he uses those things with the student athletes and, and what he requires of them in the classroom, out in the community and in, in academics and, um, and on the playing field. And, and so this is just something that we try to tie into their daily life, because I think what is most important is that we teach kids how to win in, in all parts of their life, you know, and, and it just doesn't happen. Winning just doesn't magically happen. You have to do things every single day intentionally to, um, you know, to create a winning act attitude and that doesn't necessarily mean you're always going to be victorious on the scoreboard and that's what we talk as a coaching staff you know is that uh not necessarily are you always going to win um on the scoreboard but are you winning every single day in life and are you teaching those core values to the, your student athletes oh absolutely you know we we all want to win games and and i think we do our share but you know winning in the classroom winning in the community winning in the hearts of your kids and you mentioned uh, the What Drives Winning series. Uh, one of my favorite uh, videos that I use is uh, Becky Burley's, uh, you know, The Green Dot. So, yes. uh, you know, listeners, if you're not familiar with that, just uh, uh, Google that. What Drives Winning, Becky Burley. And there's a ton of others. Sue Inquist from UCLA. Uh, great, great series. Um, Holly, I will do this at the end of the show. But um, if one of our listeners wanted to reach out 
and pick your brain a little bit more, find out uh, a little bit more about how you do things at Fort Walton Beach, what's the best way that they can get a hold of you? Or they can email me. They can call me, um, whatever works best for them. I'm on Twitter uh, and, and I'm on Facebook. So whichever way works best. Okay. And uh, for our NIAAA members, Holly's information is also on the NIAAA portal. Uh, Holly McDaniel, Fort Walton Beach. We're going to take another break, but we're coming back with some more. So stay with us. This is the Educational AD Podcast. We want to thank Sideline Interactive indoor score tables and video boards for their support of the podcast. Go to sidelineinteractive.com, schedule a live web demo and see their tables and their boards in action. Uh, they not only generate income for your department, but they also create the ultimate game day experience for your student athletes. Go to sidelineinteractive.com, check them out today. We also want to thank Huddle. Go to huddle.com and change the way you see the game. Huddle is going to provide your coaches, your teams, and your athletes the tools that they need to perform at the highest level. You're going to find a professional-grade solution to the challenges that you face as an athletic director. At Huddle, we believe in sports and teams believe in Huddle. Join the 6 million users and find out how to turn your school into a huddle school. We also want to say thanks to Gipper. Go to gipper.com and see how athletic directors are creating world-class marketing content for their school's social media channel. You can do it in seconds on any device and you don't need any design experience. Use our podcast code ADPOD10 and you'll get 10% off. That's gipper.com. Create custom content for your school's social media channel. Welcome back, everyone, to the Educational AD Podcast. Our guest is Holly McDaniel, the Director of Athletics at Fort Walton Beach High School, and that's in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. Um, Holly and I, you and I were, were talking during the break, and uh, you mentioned that you had a couple other best practices that I think would be great for our listeners to hear about. So uh, can you go ahead and share those? Sure. So I think evaluation of coaches is a really important topic, right? And I don't really think about it as evaluating necessarily me going to out there and watching them practice and having a sheet of that what they're great at and everything like that it's it's more about collaborating with them year round and having those really good discussions that that need to happen all the time where they feel comfortable coming into your office and really sharing ideas and and just having conversations Right. Not when not when something's going wrong, necessarily. It's just a constant feedback, collaboration, discussion, um, because for me as an athletic director, there's so much I can learn from my coaches on how I can serve them better. And and then there may be something that they can learn from me. I don't know. Sometimes uh, there is nothing that they can learn from me in the moment. But the more comfortable that they feel like they can come in your office and just have conversations and not really worry about um, if they're doing something wrong or if they're doing something right. You know, I think that especially young coaches oftentimes could get into this profession and they see some of the older coaches that have had a lot of success and they think that they don't have any problems in their program and that everything is really, really smooth. And that, and anybody that's been in the coaching world knows that everything isn't smooth all the time throughout the course of a season, right? Sometimes we just get better at how to handle situations and we only got better at it from one or two ways. Either we got into the situation and we didn't do it correctly and or we were mentored um, before the situation happened and we saw somebody do it the right way. And so I think it's really important for the coaches to feel comfortable talking to each other and sharing ideas and, and really talking to me and, and seeing if I can help them and, and me talking to them to feel, to understand what they need from me as an athletic director and how I can serve them. Because a, a big belief of ours is that, um, you know, we have to grow our, our teachers and our educators and in administration, that's our job for them to be the best that they can be so they can be the best coach they, they can be for their athletes. 
And so that's, I, I feel like that's a pretty good practice that we have here, that we have an open door policy and that our coaches really collaborate with each other. And, and it's an ongoing growing on, on both ways. Um, I think the other thing is, is that our coaches coach multiple sports. A lot of our coaches do. And so what that does is it keeps them involved in the athletes that, um, and, and encourages the athletes to play multiple sports and, and, and they're at everything. So they have, they, they're bought into the entire athletic department, not just their sport, but um, they serve our athletes year round and, and they work with different people. They work with different coaches and they learn from each other constantly because they're, you know, they go from, football to boys weightlifting to track and they're around a different group of coaches sometimes where everybody's consistently growing and the athletes really are encouraged to play multiple sports because of that boy that's just uh you know music to my ears as a you know multi-sport guy and you know we were very intentional uh as a school the schools where i was the ad uh, when we were hiring a head coach, you know, we would let them know this is our philosophy. This is what we believe in. And uh, we wanted them to um, years ago, I had a head basketball coach and he would say, well, I, I tell the kids it's OK if they play another sport. And I go, no, I don't want you to say it's OK. It is OK. Yeah, You don't say that. You know, I want you to say I want you to play another sport. You know, I, I want you to get coached by these other coaches and um you know, take a break from whatever the sport is. So uh, that's so refreshing to hear and uh, great to see that you're putting into practice. Um, uh, what other best practices, as long as I got you on the hook, we're gonna, <laughs> you know, get our Holly McDaniel best practices manual going. I, I don't know. Um, you know, we, we have an athletic class period here. I don't think that's anything new, but if, if you don't have that in your school, you're missing out. And, you know, it's an opportunity for your coaches to see the kids year round and and keep up with their grades keep up with what's going on in their classroom keep up with their life outside of um of school and i just think that that class period you know of course it develops the, the student athlete better at the sport but it's the relationship that really matters and i think it really makes that relationship even stronger between our coaches and our athletes so if if you know, if you don't have an athletic period in in your school, then I would encourage to do that. Um, and and then the that last thing is is I believe hiring is the most important thing we do. You got to hire the right people. You got to have you got to hire the people that share um, the vision with you and that want to um, continuously grow and grow their student athletes and. Um, their philosophy is education based and 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 understand that we're an institution that education comes first and athletics is second and and we can grow a person so much on the field and it's so hiring which it's getting harder and harder to do right um, the the supplement to coach is very small it is uh, time consuming I think the paperwork and, and the dealing with the parents and the expectations is is larger than ever. But um, man, when you when you hire the right people, uh, life is so much easier and and your students just grow so much by having somebody mentoring with mentoring them that they they love the sport just as much as them. And and it just does wonders for your school. Yeah, the, the hiring, that's a whole show unto itself. Um, I, I wish there was a way that we could, um, you know, at that first parent meeting, uh, you know, just let them know, all right, you know, here's the schedule, you know, we update it, um, you know, et cetera. And, and just let them know, hey, we're going to coach your kid and, you know, we're going to love them. We're going to help them. But, uh, you know, in, in a nice way, sit in the stands, cheer your kid. <laughs> And that's it. Uh, and that's why we have a, an entire uh, four hour course through the NIAAA called Partnering with Parents that I'm actually one of the national faculty for. And I'll be teaching at the FIAAA conference coming up, which nice. is a nice segue into our next conversation. Um, one of the things we ask our guests to do is kind of share where they're at 
on their NIAAA or in our case, FIAAA journey. So, um, and I, I and I mention this frequently, I came to the, the NIAAA, FIAAA very late in my career. I had been a head football coach and an AD, and I think I did a pretty good job but was just oblivious of our professional organizations, or maybe I chose to be oblivious. And when I took a job uh, just as the AD, and I say just, um, it was my first uh, experience with the FIAAA and I was hooked, okay? Uh, and But that's another story. Uh, Holly, where are you at in your journey with FIAAA and NIAAA right now? So I think that you and I have a lot in common in that. When I, when I was the girls basketball coach, I was oblivious on what was going on nationwide or even in the state about, you know, athletics and state statues and all those things that go into play and, and what's coming down the change and the changes. Um, so, you know, I was just embedded in the basketball world and, and I, I felt like I networked well there and I, I developed some great mentors and I felt like I could pick up the phone and call some coaches that I knew and were good friends with. But when I got into this world three years ago, I had to find a different group and I had to figure out different ways to grow. And I actually just joined the NIAAA this past year. And it was because of a college teammate who her name is Tara Getter. She is also a female athletic director in Alabama. And she said, you know, you, you got to get involved with NI, NI AAA and you got to come to the conference. And, and I tell you, just like you, I, I, so I think I joined cause you get a discount to go right. to the conference. And I said, well, why not? So I joined and I went to the conference in Nashville and who doesn't love Nashville. So that was a plus. And, um, I tagged it on the front end on a girl's trip with my mom and sisters. And then I went to the conference and they, they really had me hooked in just, first of all, how welcoming, you know, everybody is. And it was really nice to be around people that do what you do every day. Because I think that sometimes as an athletic director, uh, it's lonely. It, it, it can be lonely and um, it's hard to connect with people sometimes because you're so busy and anybody that is an athletic director is so busy and, and your coaches are, are really, you know, uh, underneath you and, and, and you're overseeing them. And so it's a different relationship when you move into this role than when they were just, you know, your colleagues. So it was, it was awesome. I, you know, I try to go to every single session I could go to try to take in, everything I can, you know, learn from people that have some amazing ideas. And the other thing is just realizing, I think when you get around people and you collaborate, you, you go back home and you are able to remember what, how lucky you are in some of the situations that you have, right? Because I think it's easy in this position, in this profession to um, forget how fortunate you are in some areas and some of the district that you work in. And we're very fortunate in the Panhandle and Okaloosa um, in athletics. And, and so it was just, it was really nice to just talk to people about what they do at their school. And, and, you know, I saw your ad on Gipper. I mean, I came back from that conference. We bought Gipper, right? Because um, good night. I needed a different social media tool than what I was using. It was taking way too much time out of my life. And I came back and um, our athletic department bought Gipper and it, it, and social media is where it's at right now. And, and is, I think I spent a 10th of the time on my social media posts since I bought Gipper. And that was something I got from that conference. Um, just small things on what's new out there and, and ways you can do things better. And, and uh, I, I need to I need to listen to your four hour segment on parents. I can tell you that. So with FI AAA. <laughs> well, uh, I, I've been on your website and uh, I, I've seen your Gipper graphics. So, you, you know, you, you've done a great job with that. Uh, and, and thanks for the shout out. Um, as you, um, you know, continue to plan, uh, you know, your journey. And again, this is for our listeners, too. Um, you know, go to your state conference, um, you know, here in Florida, it can be problematic because it's right in the middle of state track and, and baseball playoffs and everything else. But there's also webinars that are offered by the NIAAA. Um, 
going back to Nashville, um, what was your, obviously Nashville is Nashville, like you said, and you were there with uh, some of your friends, uh, but professionally speaking, you know, what was one of the uh, workshops or courses that really stuck out for you uh, as a first time attendee? And we always say the first time it's like trying to drink from the fire hose. You know, there's just so much information, but uh, what's, what's one of the professional experiences that stick out for you? Wow, that's tough because there's a lot. Um, you know, Inky Johnson was a guest speaker and, you know, he was down here um, about, mm, I, I would say about six, seven years ago that spoke to our student athletes and just completely moved them. And he was at the conference and he spoke to the athletic directors and it, it had the same effect just in a different way, you know, professionally as an athletic director. What, a, what an amazing guest speaker he is. Um, you know, they, they had some sessions of just female athletic directors. Mm -hmm. That was really cool because there are not a lot of us and, and to network with people that, you know, look like you and, and um, their journey maybe was difficult to get to where they are at, but the doors have really opened for female and athletics. It's incredible. Um, so that was really nice to, to, to be able to mix and mingle with, some female athletic directors. Um, you know, I, I think that one of the sessions was dealing with difficult parents. That was yep. really good. That was a great session in just learning some practices that you can go back and you can help your coaches with and that you can utilize. Um, that was really good. Uh, another one was just updating your knowledge on NCAA Clearinghouse yep. and maybe some things that are coming down the pipe. Um, you know, with everything with the new deals that athletes are going to be get, able to get in high school, possibly, depending on your state, that was NLI deals, that, that was incredible. There was just so many different sessions that, you know, you, you wish they were a little bit longer and you had more time. Uh, it, it, was, it was really, really good. I mean, it, sometimes it becomes a little overwhelming right? You're trying to take a lot of notes and you're, and you're trying to remember everything when you get back and, but you can go back and you can watch things and, and, and you create so many relationships where Absolutely. you can call people when you get back, when you need some help. And that's really nice because before I left, you know, um, there's an athletic director by the name of Matt Alt that is at Gulf Breeze High School. And Matt always has seemed like he's on the cutting edge of some things in athletics within his athletic department. He was somebody that as soon as I got the job, you know, I would always call him if I needed to say, hey, tell me about this or how do I do this? Um, it was nice to be able to uh, have a little bit of a black book, right? That you can go to when you need some help and you want to phone a friend. No, absolutely. The Everything you mentioned, uh, 100%. But for me, I think one of the most important things is that networking. You begin mm -hmm. to build it and add to it. Uh, it. It's just a tremendous, tremendous resource. So uh, hopefully we're going to see you uh, down in Orlando here in a couple months at uh, FIAAA. For our listeners, uh, our guest uh, is Holly McDaniel. She's the director of athletics at Fort Walton Beach High School. That's right here in Florida's Panhandle. We're going to take another break, but we've got more coming. This is the Educational AD Podcast. We want to thank Wall of Fame by Vital Signs for their support. You know, they're on a mission to bring your school's legacy to life. The Wall of Fame is an interactive touchscreen video console that is going to highlight your school's top performers, both past and present, in athletics, academics, and the arts. But Wall of Fame is so much more than that. It's also an extensive content program that allows you to tell more compelling stories to your stakeholders and engage your audience better. Go to vitalsignswalloffame.com. Check out their great products. And when you're ready to buy, go to the link vitalsignswalloffame.com slash Jake, and you'll get a nice discount. Vital Signs Wall of Fame. Bring your school's legacy to life. And we want to say thanks to Final Forms. Whether you're an athletic director, uh, an IT professional for your school district, or a school superintendent, go to finalforms.com, and they're going to show you how to prepare for your best season ever. Final Forms 
helps you engage your stakeholders uh, for your parents and has reminders about policies, about physical deadlines, and all the forms that come when you've got an athlete in the house. Final forms can help your coaches with things like certification management, uh, attendance, and communication. And for athletic directors, final forms can help you with eligibility, with rosters, and all the reports that come across your desk. You know, it's time that you talk to someone who's walked in your shoes, somebody who gets it. For more information, go to finalforms.com slash Jake. That's finalforms.com slash Jake and get started with Final Forms. Welcome back to the Educational AD Podcast. Our guest is Holly McDaniel from Fort Walton Beach High School here in Florida. Holly, one of our longstanding questions has to do with this idea of toughness. A um, hundred years ago, when I was in high school, uh, our coaches would say things like, you know, come on, Jake, you got to be tough or come on, Jake, you got to suck it up. And I think we knew what they meant and, and we pretty much did it. Uh, in the many years since I was in high school, I think we've learned much better ways to communicate to our student athletes. But I still think toughness is an important component of sport and of life. So here's my question for you. How can an athletic director or a coach help a Generation Z kid to develop toughness while also being aware of the, the many challenges that they have to face that I never had to go through way back in the 70s? Uh, do you have any advice for us? Well, I think that regardless of what generation it is, I think that there's something that remains the same. And, and that is that those student athletes want somebody to care about them, right? That, that is the most important thing is the relationship that you have between the coach and the student athlete. And that it's not just about what they do on the court or on the field that you care about them all the time. And, and if, if they don't feel that, I, I think that regardless of your practices, um, you, you're going to struggle with this generation, you know, and I say that because when, when I was playing and probably when you were playing, we were taught that you give your coach everything you got, you go out there, you give 100%, and regardless, you do what he says, he or she says, and so we respected the person for the position. And this generation is a little bit different and, and that, that's not in a negative way. You know, they have learned that I deserve respect um, and you deserve respect if you give me respect, right? That respect needs to be mutual. And I think that's where we've kind of grown in our profession is that, um, you know, we can't just tell a kid to do what we want them to do. We got to show them how to do it. We got to build a relationship with them that they know that, we have their best interest in heart, and that's why we're trying to get them to do what we want them to do. And we got to teach. We got we got to teach them how to do it. And it, and I, I think that that piece is probably the most important piece. The other piece I think that's really important is that we learn how to communicate with the parents. And, and early in my career, I, I'll tell you, Coach Craig said, you stay away from them. You don't talk to them, right? You talk to only the athletes and, and you stay away from them. But as time went on and, um, you know, society changed, you have to change with society. You have to develop different practices to meet the kids where they're at and to meet with the parents where they're at. And so those days of I'm just not talking to parents, right. uh, that's, that's not realistic, right? Because when that student athlete gets in the car, and, and we got to remember they're still 14, 15, 16 years old. So, you know, that they have to know that the parents, their parent and the coach is on the same page, that they both care about them, but that everybody is communicating and talking. And so, you know, for me, when I was coaching basketball, I, we, my coaching staff and us, we would always say every five to six years, we had to kind of reevaluate on how we were doing things. And, you know, it's not that you're going to change what your expectations. It might just be that you change on how you get the kids to do what you expect them to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, 
15, 16 years ago, my players used to come in my office and lay on the couch and want to spend two, three hours. I'd have to kick them out and be like, y'all got to go home. These kids aren't that way anymore. You know, you, you got to, you got to meet them where they're at. You got to go to their, their place. You know, you have to go into the locker room a little bit more. You've got to make sure that you set up times that as a team, you guys have time spent outside of electronic devices um, you, and, and really dig into them as a whole entire person, not just as an athlete. And so I think that it's most important that you don't change your expectation. You want to create, as we say, grit in them, right? And you want them to really learn how to um, get through tough times and everything. It's just that you have to go a little bit of a different way to get there. And it's not that you don't require as much out of them in a two hour practice. It's just that you might teach the practice a little bit different. Yeah, and it everything you said, it kind of goes back to something you said earlier and we hear it a lot because it's true. It's, all about building those relationships. You know, if you have that relationship with the kid or as an AD to a coach, if you built that relationship, you can demand a lot uh, because that respect is there. That trust is there. So, uh, you know, appreciate you sharing. No, I, I agree hundred percent, you know, let's uh, help these kids to develop toughness because they can do it. Holly McDaniel, this has been really cool spending some time with you, getting to know you just a little bit, but we're not done yet. Uh, we always wrap up with the athletic director's toolbox. Now, uh, you certainly know your way around the world of athletics, but we're going to take our final break. And when we come back, I'm going to challenge you to send out a brand new athletic director on their very first job. But I'm only going to let you put three things in their toolbox. <laughs> so uh, let's hear from our last sponsor, Athletic Surveys, who sponsor this segment. And when we come back, we're going to find out what Holly McDaniel is going to put into her new athletic director toolbox. Please stay with us. We want to thank Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack for sponsoring the AD Toolbox segment. Athletic Surveys are a quick, easy, and affordable way for you to collect comprehensive data that allows you to evaluate and improve your entire program. Athletic directors typically only hear back from that 2% the frustrated parent or uh, the student athlete. And we need to hear back from them so we can affect positive change in our program. But we also need to hear back from the 98% that really love and support our program. And that's where athletic surveys comes in. They're going to create a custom survey for your school that will allow you to take the pulse of your parents and your student athletes. And that's tremendously valuable information that you can use when you're talking to your principal a school board member, or even that uh, squeaky wheel parent. Go to athleticsurveys.com. Check out all the ways that they can help you create that custom survey. That's Athletic Surveys. Let them take your program from good to great. Well, it's that time of the podcast. We have been visiting with Holly McDaniel, the athletic director at Fort Walton Beach High School in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. Longtime teacher and coach there as well. Um, Holly, um, you, you certainly established that, uh, you know, your way around the AD's office, but right now I'm going to challenge you to send out a brand new AD, but I'm only going to let you give them three tools. What three tools are going to go into your athletic director toolbox? So I think one thing in the toolbox needs to make sure that you collaborate with your coaches to create your first year, a shared vision and mission that everybody is going to get on board for. So I think it's really important for you to have a shared vision and buy-in from the coaches, because if the coaches you know, don't believe in what they're doing every day, they're just not going to do it, right? Like you got to believe in what in what you're doing every day and everybody's got to be on the same page and once you get the buy-in and the shared vision and mission from the coaches then I think it's important to continue those conversations with your coaches on how you can continue to grow and develop and also have student leaders student athlete leaders that give you feedback and and keep you in the loop on how 
or better ways that you can grow as an athletic department and what they would like to see that change or what they think is great. Um, listening to our students is so important on how they view our athlete, your athletic department and, and what they want to see happen in something that they're a part of. And, and so that between the coaches and the athletic director and your administration and the student athletes, and I'm even going to say this word, the parents, right? Well, it, it, it is a community that has to be involved and really buy in what you're selling. Because, you know, we're selling um, something that is going to make winners. And so if everybody can get on the same page, that's, that's really important. So it's constant communication with, the, with your coaches. And, and I say that because I think before you're an athletic director and you're a coach, you say, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this. And when you get in this position, you, you don't have time to do half of what you thought you were going to do. And so you can get a little bit overwhelmed. But com collaboration is really important. Number two is the communication piece. The communication piece is how do your coaches communicate with the parents? How do your coaches communicate with the athletes? How do you communicate with the coaches? How do you communicate with the athletes? How do we as an athletic department communicate with the teachers in our building and our administration? Um, and what does that look like? How do we communicate with the parents? You know, what, what are our rules for when and how do we communicate with parents? I think is really important. You know, we have a, and I think most athletic departments, we have a 24 hour rule, but you know, you got to stick by that rule. You got to stick by that rule and you got to not get emotional and you got to say, make an appointment with me. Um, when we do communicate with parents and we have a meeting, we have a rule that we don't have one person in that meeting. We have an assistant coach in that meeting or, or we have an administrator in that meeting or we have the AD in that meeting. Um, when we do communicate, we work the chain of command and that's tough sometimes, but you gotta, you gotta send them back to the coach, to the program that their child is involved in. And you gotta make sure that they work chain of command and they can't just come walk in your office and have a meeting without the coach. So the communication piece and how that's going to work is really important in the athletic department. Um, and then third, I, I'm gonna say this, you gotta make time for yourself because this, um, you know, this position is 24 hours, sometimes seven days a week, it feels like. And so, you know, when it is the weekend and, and a lot of us have games that we have to be at on Saturdays and our coaches are going through something that we want to make sure we're available. And I try to be available to my coaches all the time. But you have to make sure that, um, you know, you are a model for what your coaches want to be that need to be. And that is that, you know, you're going to put your family first and that you are going to make time for yourself. And, and then you are going to um, be available to them, but you have got to make time for yourself um, and, and put yourself as a priority, or I think it's a short lived profession if that doesn't happen. And I think most of us that are in this possession position. We were coaches for a long time. And it is something I can say that I struggled with as a coach too, is making time for myself and, and um, not constantly thinking about what I need to do better and how can I get better and how am I going to get my team better and all that. And so I, you know, I read a lot of books in the off season to try to prioritize that and keep my, keep my priorities in line. But um yeah, so I think the three things is collaboration constantly, um, communication, make sure that you have your key things about communicate, how you're going to communicate with your community, your parents, your coaches, your administration, your teachers in the building, and make time for yourself. Yeah, you probably saw me scribbling those down. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot before I let you go. Uh, the one about self-care. We always talk about it. You know, we, we tell our coaches that they need to do it. You know, we tell our colleagues, uh, you know, that they need to do it. Um, myself, I think over my career, I got better as uh, I moved on. But I, I would say, say at best, I would give myself a grade of a C plus or B minus for that. Now, how would Holly grade herself right now? 
Um, I think I'm probably at a C. <laughs> um, I'm I'm working towards a B. There you um, go. Yeah. You know, I have a I have a senior in high school, and I think that puts a lot in perspective for me in his last couple of years. Right, that um, that time is short, and and you know, when he was born, I thought I had all the time in the world with him, and here he is. He's about to turn 18 and graduate from high school, and. You know, and he went every, everywhere with me. He was running around the gym when I was coaching. He was always by my side. And a lot of times he'd get in the car with me after a win or a loss and he'd be talking and I wasn't listening. My mind was running about what I should have done differently or how I screwed that game up or something, right? And then you fast forward, you know, and you realize that, you know, those those times are are are, are coming to an end, you know, you're going to have less time with them. And I think that that has helped me maybe kind of get closer to the B <laughs> from a C, but not quite there. <laughs> well, we're always trying to get better. And I know right where you're coming from. I, I was fortunate. Uh, my wife's career coach, career teacher, our three kids were all in sports. Imagine that. Uh, yeah. and, and so, you know, we were at those games too. And, and on those drives home, I remember that, but, uh, again, Hey, we, we might be C's, but we're trying to become B's. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what I was in school too. Yeah. I probably was a, a C student. <laughs> Right. I, I, I would say, you know, hey, I made that upper 25% possible. Okay. So uh, <laughs> Holly, this has just been, again, very cool. Appreciate you sharing. Uh, before we go one more time, if one of our listeners wanted to reach out, pick your brain listeners, I think you got a great resource here. What's the best way they can get a hold of you? So my email is mcdanielh at okaloosaschools.com. Um, you can call the school. You can reach out to me on Facebook or Twitter. Um, or heck, you can you can have my cell phone number if you want it, and you can shoot me a text or call me anytime. I think that I probably can learn from them more than they can learn from me, so I welcome the phone call. All right. Well, again, uh, for our NIAAA members, Holly's information is also on the NIAAA portal. Holly McDaniel, all the best uh, for the rest of this spring season. And I really hope you're going to be able to make it down to the FIAAA conference uh, that first week in May. Very cool. Thank you very much for having me. For our listeners, uh, we appreciate you listening. And we upload the Zoom videos of these interviews to the Educational AD Podcast YouTube channel. We appreciate you supporting us. Come back next time for more best practices on the Educational AD Podcast. Thanks again for listening to today's episode of the Educational AD Podcast. We'll see you next time. Don't forget to check out our sponsors and our partners. Uh, we couldn't do it without them. And if you have suggestions on how we can make the podcast better, or if you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, shoot me an email at jakestouchdown at gmail.com. We'll see you next time on the Educational AD Podcast.